Hello and welcome. Good evening or morning, wherever it is that you're joining us from. My name is Claudia Marroquin and I'm the Director of Admissions here at Bowdoin. And thank you so much for joining us for our fifth live stream for admitted students. If you've tuned in live for some of our previous live streams or if you've watched the recordings that we've made available, you're probably noticing that Dean Whitney Sewell isn't with us tonight. Um, I'm really lucky that I get to be able to moderate for you tonight and I, that I have the honor of being joined by some amazing panelists. I'm thrilled to be a moderator um, since I've worked with so many of these folks um, on the panel pretty closely over my time working at the college, but I also utilized many of these offices and campus resources during my own time at Bowdoin as a student. So before we really begin, I also just wanted to take the moment to congratulate you not only as an alumna of the college, but also as an admissions officer. I had the privilege of reading many, many of your applications um, and sitting in on committees. Um, so I'm incredibly excited um, that you were admitted to the college and really, really hope you'll choose to become a member of this amazing community. So like our previous live streams, um, we do have an amazing um, collection of staff and students who've joined us tonight. So I wanna have um, each of them introduce themselves so you know who's with us. Um, so Tess, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. All right. Hello. Uh, my name is Tessa Peterson. I am a senior and I am from Nederland, Colorado. And I saw at least one Colorado in the mix. So welcome and welcome to everybody. Uh, I study earth and oceanographic science and Francophone studies, amongst other things. If you're here for co-curricular opportunities, I studied abroad in New Zealand in the spring of my junior year. I've worked on campus jobs with admissions and with the career, um, the Center for Career Exploration and Development. I run cross country and have uh, also been an active member of the Outing Club. I'm so, so excited to be here with you, even though I can't see you. I'm really excited uh, to share this time and um, to be graduating and then to talk to incoming students is really exciting. So I'm happy to be here. Great, thank you. And Sarah, can we have you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Seams. I'm the director of the Joseph McKean Center for the Common Good, which is the community engagement center on campus. And I'm happy to talk more about that later. I grew up in Western Maine. Uh, so I'm also happy to answer questions about the state from a personal and a professional perspective. Thanks. Thank you. And Diego, you're next. Awesome. Hey everybody, I'm Diego. I'm from Arequipa, Peru. Uh, but I'm currently living in Maine. Um, I was also a member of the cross country team my first year and I'm interested in health professions. Um, so I'm looking to go into oncology research or something like that. Um, I've worked in many departments across uh, Bowdoin and uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you all today. Great, thank you. And Seth, you're next. Hi everyone, I'm Seth Ramos. I'm Director of Health Professions Advising at the college. Um, I've been with the college now for 17 years, first as a faculty in neuroscience and psychology, and then now um, working as in advising full time. Um, I also direct our Beckman Scholars Program, which is a program for um, students doing research in the natural sciences and chemistry. Great. Thank you. And Christine? Um, I'm Christine Winderstein. I'm the Director of Off-Campus Study and International Programs at Bowdoin College. I've been at the college for 10 years and our office works with students who are thinking about integrating and study abroad or study off-campus opportunity in their undergraduate degree. Perfect. All right, Katie, you're next. Hi, my name is Katie Burns. I direct the Baldwin Center for Learning and Teaching. This is my eighth year at the college. I've also served as a faculty member in the education department. Great. And last but not least, Kristen. Hi, uh, congratulations everyone on your admission. It's exciting. I'm Kristen Brennan. I'm the executive director of Career Exploration and Development. And the mission of our group really is to make sure that everyone who graduates Bowdoin is prepared to get the first great job or into grad school and has the skills to get the next one. So we can talk more about what that looks like. But I have the great pleasure of working with really every student on campus. Great. Thank you. So before we really get started, I just have a couple of reminders. 
The first is that we actually do have closed captioning available for our live stream tonight. So in the, on the bottom of your screen, you should see a closed caption box. You'll just wanna go ahead and turn that on. Um, and the other piece is as we are going through the live stream, um, please go ahead and enter any questions you have for our panelists um, using the Q&A box. I'll be using um, what's coming through live um, via the Q&A box, as well as the questions that were submitted ahead of time via the form or email or through previous live streams to make sure that we're getting um, as many questions answered tonight. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. And one of the questions um, that I already seen pop up a few times and was definitely submitted a number of times uh, before the session was around um, the Center for uh, Career Exploration and Development. So Kristen, if you can tell us a little bit more about how um, career placement works at Bowdoin, how you go ahead uh, advising students in a variety of different sectors. Um, and then if the students, especially I know Tessa, you had mentioned, uh, and Diego as well, having done some work with career planning, if you can also chime in um, to get us started. Sure, do you want me to start? Claudia or? Yes, Kristen, if you can just, again, um, go ahead with a little bit of an overview of how uh, career uh, exploration works at Bowdoin. Yeah, so like so many things at Bowdoin, it's really individualized because everyone's story and everybody's aspirations are a little bit different. So that really is the core commitment. It doesn't matter what you're interested in pursuing. We want to help you in the pursuit of that. And it might look a little bit differently because, you know, different industries work differently and recruit differently. So the way we're organized on the team is we have advisors in industry groups that have life experience and work experience in those industry groups. So, you know, our pre-law advisor and the person who directs advising is a lawyer and also ran um, programs, you know, within a law school. And our person that works very closely with Seth on advising in health careers and also in science was a bench scientist. And so, you know, that's the way that we organize ourselves that we can bring expertise to the table. But largely, it's not about what we know. It's about understanding where you are and what it is that you want to do and helping figure out what the right first step is for you. So a lot of that is exploring and getting the vocabulary and, you know, getting started. Um, but the kind of way we can support you runs the gamut from, you know, truly exploratory to really targeted toward a job and preparing the materials and all the things you think a, a career um, exploration development center might do. So we do a lot of skill building. Diego and, and Tessa can really speak to that because they played a big role in the big program that we have this year. Um, and we also, it, it would be remiss if I didn't just mention how much we engage alumni. We have, a, of course, a base of employers who may or may not be alumni or have anything to do with Bowdoin that, you know, come year after year to recruit talent at Bowdoin. But we have an incredible alumni network. And I say that as someone who's had exposure to some pretty incredible alumni network, but this one is really beyond compare in terms of the amount of energy um, and the amount of themselves and the way that alumni really put themselves out to connect back to Bowdoin and higher Bowdoin students. Um, so those are kind of a few things we could touch on more in depth later, if you like. Thank you. And Tessa and Diego, anything you would like to add or share from your experiences working with Kristen and the advisors in career explorations? Sure, I can go. Um, so as Kristen and Claudia uh, alluded to, Diego and I both worked at sophomore boot camp this past year. So we were amongst a group of about 20 upperclassmen working um, for this boot camp over winter break and 200 sophomores came back to do a week long uh, workshopping and building career skills and connecting with the alumni network. So what I would say is first of all that interactions with career exploration and development start early in your time at Bowdoin, not because there's pressure to, but because you're supported at every step of the way. So when you are in your first year and you're just thinking about what's coming the next summer or how can I you know, use on-campus employment to launch me into a career? Or how can I find connections with something that I'm interested in studying? They're gonna meet you where you're at. So whether you're in your first year or you're a sophomore and you're just thinking about how to build those key career skills and then you can go to sophomore boot camp, where you're a graduating senior and you're trying to figure out really how to lock in to the Bowdoin network and uh, you know find that first maybe job after graduating. They're going to meet you where you're at. Sophomore boot camp itself, maybe Diego wants to say more details about what it was like, but 
it's such a special thing to be a part of, even as an upperclassman. I was like, I'm learning, this is the coolest. Anyway, maybe you want to say more about that. Yeah, definitely. The only thing that I would add is um, I've been lucky to be on both, both ends of it. Since my first year, I've been meeting with Seth to kind of make a plan and see what I would do for my future in terms of health professions. And then this last year, as Tessa was saying, um, being able to be part of the sophomore boot camp and really kind of like paying it forward and letting these students, giving them the insights that they need um, and seeing how I can help, helping them to build networks, but also after that, seeing where they grow and what directions they take, it's been really satisfying. So I've been really happy to have those experiences. Awesome, thank you. Um, so there's actually gonna be two questions that I'm gonna bundle together and give Seth and Christine the opportunity to talk a little bit about your offices and the overlap that happens. And naturally, this is how the questions are coming through. Um, so I'll pose the question, you can talk about your offices and then go ahead and start answering the question. But the question as it's come through is, um, how does study abroad work? Is it easy to uh, process or get an approved to study abroad? Is it harder to do being tied into a certain major such as being a pre-med student or other majors? And then this other question that's very much related is, is it possible to do pre-med and study abroad? So I'll let Christine maybe start tackling the um, question around how do students go about applying for studying abroad? How do you support them? Um, how does that factor in with some of their majors? And then Seth, I'll turn to you. Great. Yeah, sure. So um, our office will begin working with students during their sophomore year. So, um, and that's important because you want to know if you come up to campus as a first year that we are, we're not ignoring you. We think it's really important that first year students dig into the on-campus experience and connect with professors and other groups on campus. So we will reach out to students at the beginning of the sophomore year. And um, it's not a difficult process to think about study off campus. Um, it's called study off campus at Bowdoin because it's both international and also there are some domestic opportunities. So our office is called off campus study and there's two advisors in our office, myself and the assistant director and we split all of the advising. Um, we believe that you know a study abroad opportunity like any other opportunity on campus should be approached intentionally um, and integrated into your undergraduate degree so we are looking for students to articulate what their personal and academic goals are for off-campus study um, about 60 percent of Bowdoin students or almost 60 percent of students 60 percent of Bowdoin students study off campus during their time at Bowdoin um, the majority of them study abroad during the academic year, so fall, spring, or year, and the majority for a semester. Very few students participate in the summertime. Um, and one of the largest reasons for that is aid is very generous during the academic year for a semester off campus. And also it provides you a longer period to sort of culturally or linguistically immerse yourself in a local opportunity. Um, we can get into the uh, conversation about whether pre-med or any major really can study off campus and really there are so many different opportunities. Bowdoin doesn't run any of its own study abroad programs which means that we really have the ability to advise, stu advise students to find the best match and the right fit. Um, so we will work with students rather than kind of push it, putting students into our own programs, we really will work with a broad range of program providers, um, organizations, and direct enrollment universities, and ask students not just what they want to study, but in what setting do they want to study? Do they want to study in a large research institution or a thematic field-based program? Um, do they want to study abroad in a foreign language or in English? Um, and to answer your question about pre-med, it is possible, I'm going to let answer answer the question about what that means for their you know, graduate school opportunities and med school opportunities, but we have had students who are pre-med, fulfilling pre-med majors, who earn major credit when they're going abroad and might study something related to public health or biomedicine or neuroscience, and then students who are actually decide to do all of their pre-med at Bowdoin and to use their study abroad semester to engage with something that they're passionate about academically, but is not necessarily going to give them credit toward their major. We are looking for academic engagement um, not specifically meeting major or minor credits, although those, those come along the way. Okay, so I'll just jump in right now and say, yes, uh, you can definitely study abroad and be pre-med. Um, so let me back up a moment 
and take you all the way through that. Um, so like it's been said so many times, um, our offices are open and available from the moment you get on campus. I begin working with students uh, during orientations, help them choose their first classes. Um, and I am available to work individually with students. Again, I also have an assistant director. Um, and the two of us work together with students to help them plan an individualized path through uh, their four years at Bowdoin. Um, we, our office also helps students to sort of explore and understand why they're interested in the health careers and maybe to explore the different health careers. Um, there is so much more that goes into an application than any classes or standardized tests. And so it's really helping a student make their own individualized plan to, to understand and produce a competent application. So there is no one path through this. Um, and that's really important to understand. Uh, most students now are choosing not to go directly into medical school. Um, this is true nationally. Um, the majority of students now take at least one year after graduation before entering medical school. Um, and that, what that means is that a student then, can, when they make that decision, can use the full four years of the college to prepare. And that does add some extra room for things like study abroad, should that be important to them. It also gives you the opportunity to study something other than just the sciences. Uh, there is no requirement to major in a science. It doesn't look better to be a science major going into medical school nor does it look better to be an English major, um, but medical schools are definitely looking for passion and engagement in your academics. And so one of the ways you might wanna explore that is to study classics in Greece or the Italian language in Italy, or to um, do some sort of comparative public health in the developing world um, through one of those, those um, study abroad programs. And it's really sort of up to individual students to figure out what, what is where they're important, um, what's most important to them in, in navigating this. And it's our jobs to help you to think about what all of the, um, what all that means, <laughs> um, whether it might add an extra year to, um, you know, so to before you're able to enter medical school or something like that. Great. Thank you. And um, Tessa or Diego, anything? I know, Tessa, you mentioned you studied abroad in New Zealand. Um, do you want to share anything about why you chose the program that you did and how that may have then um, segued back into your major or your experiences on campus? Yeah, so I was really nodding to what Christine was saying about an individualized path. So as I said, I'm an earth and oceanographic science and Francophone studies or French major. And I studied abroad in New Zealand, which as you can imagine, my French professors were sort of like, how can you do this? Not really, but um, they, you know, being able to choose a program that was going to fit my like personal goals for what a semester was gonna look like away from Bowdoin, and then also meet academic goals in kind of going more towards the earth science and I ended up taking just incredible geology classes. I was studying in on the Southern Island and took amazing geology classes about you know what was happening on the Southern Island and being able to kind of go more towards that route and having the support from you know the Center for Co-Curricular Opportunities off-campus study and also having the support from both of my major advisors to the point where I actually ended up also taking a French class in New Zealand and getting major credit towards that and being able to kind of progress in both of my majors, but making the right choice for me personally. So, you know, what I had really hoped for from a semester away from Bowdoin and, you know, 60% of students study abroad, but it's really hard to make the choice to take one semester away. Every semester at Bowdoin is so precious. And so you really have to feel confident about what you're going into and they really help you to feel excited about what that's going to be. So for me, going to New Zealand was also a chance to get outside. I ended up doing a lot of kayaking and hiking, and I took a class in Maori performing arts and in every way got to go deeply into that place. And 
I think that I had the support all along for what my personal goals were going to be, as well as matching the kind of academic engagement piece. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to go to one of the questions that was submitted um, just before the live stream started. And um, Sarah, this one's going to go to you. Um, so the question is, what are some of the resources in the surrounding Brunswick community um, to engage with the community beyond campus itself? Great. Uh, before I go into details around that, I thought it might be helpful to give a little bit of background on uh, the McKean Center so uh, and Bowdoin's uh, connection to this concept of the common good. Uh, you may have learned about it when you were looking at Bowdoin, but just briefly, um, the McKean Center is named after Joseph McKean, who was the first president of the college. And at the opening of the college in 1802, as a part of his inaugural address, he said, that uh, literary institutions are founded and endowed for the common good and not for the private advantage of those who resort to them for an education. And he went on to talk about um, what he called a peculiar obligation, basically that if you are privileged enough to receive this education, uh, that you have an obligation to give back in some way and that the education is not just for you, but it's for the benefit of society. Uh, and so the McKean Center, uh, what we do, um, and the, to answer the question about the resources in the community, we are really kind of a hub to connect students with community opportunities and connect the community with interested, energetic uh, students who are looking to include the common good as a part of their education. And so that can take a lot of different forms. Uh, most students will engage in the community through our office in some way before they graduate. Some students will take part in the, one of our volunteer groups where uh, they have the opportunity to volunteer weekly with a local organization. A lot of our volunteer groups, we have about 38 of them right now. About half of them work with kids in some way. That's definitely a big interest. So that might be through mentoring or tutoring or sharing some specific skill that you're interested in. Uh, other types of volunteering can range from um, Volunteer Lawyers Project, which is based in Portland and provides free um, legal uh, services to low-income Mainers to Midco's Hunger Prevention Program that's right here in Brunswick and is walking distance from campus, uh, which uh, serves food six days a week and has a food pantry as well. Uh, some students may choose to volunteer related to a career interest that they have, and others may just be looking for a way to connect with the local community. Um, we have, uh, we're really fortunate in Brunswick to have a ton of community organizations that are doing everything from providing arts to basic needs that, that individuals have. Um, and the role of the McKean Center is to cultivate partnerships that are reciprocal, so that our students are learning from the community and the opportunities that they have with local organizations, while also benefiting those organizations and helping them to achieve their missions. Thank you. So um, another question just came in that relates to volunteer programs and starts to cross into a few of the other offices that are here. So. Um, Seth and Diego, may, and maybe you can um, tag team this question, but can you expand even more on volunteer opportunities, and then Kristen as well, um, and internship opportunities as they relate to health professions? Um, so I'm not sure who would like to take the first stab at that one. I can. Um, I, again, everything is personalized. Uh, there is no one path to uh, medical school. And so I often get this question, you know, when should I do my research? Well, research is really important if you're interested in exploring a career in research, or if you are um, considering research as, as your career, um, or, or maybe you know that this is something you want to do, and so you want to get a lot of experience with it. Um, it is not necessary to get into medical school, however. And so it's not something you have to do. So the, the conversations really begin with what are your interests? Where are your passions? What do you want to know about yourself? And how can you explore those kinds of things? Um, because ultimately, you want to come out to an, the other side of, of Bowdoin with a, a wealth of experiences that show who you are and reflect your values. And so it becomes very individualized. Um, we, have, we have the McKean Center. We have career exploration and development to work with students. Um, my office also shares all kinds of internship opportunities. Um, Diego and his Pre-Health Society are working really hard to connect students 
Um, Diego, I know, has worked with a uh, local pathologist that, that uh, called up my office one day looking for somebody to assist with um, autopsies, and he was able to go and do that. So, so things happen. We have hospitals here. Um, students volunteer at the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital in Portland. They volunteer at Midcoast Hospital, which is a short jitney ride from, from campus. Um, but there are all kinds of opportunities. Midcoast Senior Health, we have a, a dementia care center. We have a, um, um, many opportunities for students to engage and explore their interests in, in medicine. And it really comes down to matching the students' interests with the opportunities that are available. Thank you. Diego, did you want to comment very quickly about some of those opportunities? And then we can go back to Sarah as well. I saw her raise her hand quickly. Definitely. Yeah, I would echo that. I think the most meaningful experience was um, for a semester, I was volunteering at a pain procedures clinic nearby. And that just really gave me the experience of like getting to see what it's like to be part of a medical care team. Obviously, I wasn't doing any invasive procedures but it was still getting to see patients, getting to talk to patients, and just doing some of the work that um, the rest of the team does. So I was very grateful for that opportunity. Great. And Sarah, did you have something else to add on? Yeah, just quickly, I wanted to mention another facet of uh, our work in the McKean Center and another aspect of the common good is how uh, we make connections between the academic and the co-curricular experiences of students. And so we have community engaged courses uh, at Bowdoin where a professor may choose to have a project or some aspect of their course that connects with the community in some way. And so related to this question, an example, there's a, a psychology course this semester, clinical psychology lab uh, that has partnered with Oasis, which is a, a free uh, clinic here in Brunswick um, to, to help them to think about how they can expand their offerings around um, psychiatric care um, and counseling. Uh, and so those opportunities are, are great where you can find them in existing courses and then uh, students can also develop independent studies that include community engagement components where they can, they can really explore a particular interest that they have academically and figure out a way to connect that to their interests in the community as well. Great, thank you. Um, so because you brought up academic opportunities and with some of the class experiences. Um, Katie, I wanted to go to you um, with a question that was submitted, and then I'm gonna add on a little bit to that question. So the question is, um, the students would love to hear a little bit more about support for students' success in the classroom, and if you can comment about um, any support services, especially for students with learning um, differences. And my add on to that would be, with all of the things that we've heard so far with um, students taking advantage of volunteer opportunities and study abroad and uh, internships, how do they balance all of that? And what kind of resources are available through uh, the Center in Learning for Teaching for the academic success to then lead into all of these amazing opportunities co-curricularly? Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, as all of you know, and as you already experienced, right, life is really full for Bowdoin students. Um, they do a lot of things in a lot of different arenas. And one of the things that at our Center for Learning and Teaching, we really try to emphasize is everyone can always sort of be more effective as a learner and as a student. So even if you come in and you did amazing things in high school, which you all do and did, you sort of get to this point, you're like, there might be a different way to do this, or I want to take a really challenging class, and how am I going to learn in earth and oceanographic science when I don't even know sort of what that is, right? I'm going to take a class in something I've never taken a class in before. So there are a couple sort of different levels of support. So there are what we call Q tutors, so quantitative reasoning tutors. So upper class peers who work either they lead study groups in STEM courses or any course that has quantitative reasoning. They also serve as individual tutors. We also have writing assistants at the Center for Learning and Teaching. So you can meet, Tessa is one, you can meet with a writing assistant one-on-one -on -one to work on your writing. Some of them also get embedded in courses. So it's part of the course that you get to meet and have this extra help. 
We also have mentors who work with students. So you can come in at the beginning of your semester and say, how can I plan out my semester? And Tess and I have talked through some of these things. Even upperclassmen come in and say, hey, I'm trying to do all of these things. How do I make that possible? And so we have sort of students who serve almost as academic coaches. And we also have professional staff who can serve as an academic coach to just help figure out how do I fit in the things that I want to fit in, whether it's this week or this month or this semester or sort of in my time at Bowdoin. So those are some of the resources. For students who come in with learning differences, there is an Office of Accessibility, Student Accessibility, that really works with students and sort of tailors and talks through accommodations, works directly with faculty to make sure you sort of get the accommodations that you need. I also get the privilege of working with faculty around teaching. And so one of the principles that we use is sort of a universal design for learning. So how in our design of classes and in learning environments do we sort of have it the most accessible to the most students? And then if you need to accommodate beyond that, you do that as well. But there's a lot of sort of intentionality in the design of courses at Bowdoin to make sure that they can be as accessible as possible. Great, thank you. So I'm going to start circling back. There are a couple of questions that are coming up based on things everyone has said already. So the first one um, that I'm circling back to, I'm going to have Diego and um, Kristen and possibly Tessa also comment. So people want to know a little bit more about the sophomore boot camp. So if you can talk a little bit more about what happens uh, during that and how many students attended. And then the add-on question to that um, is, uh, how are students approaching their job searches um, and using career services even during this remote period? So Kristen and then the students, if you want to tackle that. Sure. So sophomore boot camp, it's funny, actually, students helped us name boot camp. I would have called it something like professional development and skills and so on. Um, and students were like, we love boot camps. We've been doing boot camps for all kinds of things. Um, so it's much less militaristic and much more individually supportive than it might sound. Um, but the idea really was we have somebody, uh, sophomore year is a lot of the moment when people say, oh, I think I need to start figuring out like my next couple summers and um, what I want to do with my time. So the idea was sort of just the right timing to think, what's the best use of the two and a half years I have ahead? And not just my summers, but my time in, in class and my extracurriculars is kind of related to some of the points Katie was making about about fitting it all in. Um, and the first most important thing is to chart your own course and know yourself well enough to know what skills I'm interested in and what interests I have and what that might look like mapped onto a career. So, so the actual design is about two thirds career, sort of what you might think of conventional job getting or career skill development. You end up with a resume, a cover letter, an application that you started at least if not completed and networking with alumni, which actually people found the most daunting to begin with, and I think the most fun and exhilarating by the end, so maybe Diego can speak to that. But um, so that's the idea is what is the whole super nut skill set you would need to get your first internship or summer opportunity or fellowship um, or research opportunity. And then um, the next piece was um, skills for being great on the job. So all the things that over time students have said, I gosh, I wish I had public speaking, negotiation, an Excel course, which was taught by one of Katie's colleagues in the Center for Learning and Teaching. You know, all the things that I just, I wish I could just, just have them in a couple of days. So we put together, you know, that kind of programming for the, the remainder of the time. Uh, maybe, maybe um, Diego can speak to, you know, the networking piece or anything else that you like. And then we can come back around to remote support. Definitely. So you, you go in um, not really knowing what to expect, but you come out, like they said, you come out with a resume, cover letter, a bunch of materials, but also you get to class a little better. You get to be connected with the team leaders. They handpick like 25 and they're from different fields. And then Tessa was managing all the team leaders and she was great. She was just very animated and she was very helpful in creating these activities. Um, but it really gives you a chance to think about your future and it's not in a stressful environment. So I think that's the greatest thing that the sophomores got out of it. And I was happy to see, you definitely see a different person coming out at the end of the boot camp. so. Great. It's really fun. We asked ask students to, to self-report. Did, you know, did I grow, did I learn on how to do some of these things like write a resume, but also have some clarity. And they all said I really did. So that was fun to see. Um, and with everything, your peers are such a great resource. So that was why it was terrific to have upperclassmen who've been there and done that um, to, to help facilitate all the tables and make it a, make a big experience small. 
Um, so on the remote support piece, um, you know, so the good news is that we are already accustomed to supporting students with their careers remotely. So we have, as you know, 60% of people studying abroad. So when you're a junior, you call us and you call us like this on a Zoom call or a phone call um, or back and forth with your application and drafts and things on email. So, so we already know how to do that. Um, and we already had had successful virtual events with employers. So we just essentially moved everything online. So if you go in now to our, our system, we use to manage the stuff, you can make appointments, you can go to an event, you can get two events tonight before this event. Um, so, so we did all of that, you know, I think, um, what we're trying to be very thoughtful of is just to pace and have it be happening at a pace that people can absorb given what all they're managing in their lives. So we're totally respectful of some people are very focused right now on classes. Um, some people have something that they, they already know has landed and they're sort of, you know, um, focused on classes and other things for that reason. People are adjusting to being at home. So, um, but everything basically we could do in person we can do online and are, so. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna circle back to Sarah and then um, Katie with two questions that could be related. Um, they are around orientation. Um, so Sarah, um, the question for you is, what orientation trips um, does the McKean Center offer? What do you do during those trips? And then um, I'll come circle back to Katie with the follow-up question. So can you talk a little bit about what the McKean Center has done in previous years, knowing that we still have to figure out what this fall semester and what orientation will look like, um, but addressing it just from what has been done in the previous uh, orientation years. Sure, uh, so we partner with the Bowdoin Outing Club uh, to offer orientation trips to all incoming first year students. So all students go on trips, there's also the Bowdoin Science Experience. So pretty much if you're coming in, you're going, you're a part of the Bowdoin Science Experience, an outing club trip or a McKean Center trip. And so for the McKean Center trips, we uh, are all over the state in different communities. We, uh, when I say all over the state, I literally mean every region of the state we have trips in. So um, we do keep some students local so that they can learn about Brunswick, Portland, Lewis and Auburn, some of the communities that are just within an easy drive of campus. Uh, and those trips often are focused on a specific topic. Uh, we usually have a public health trip, a hunger and homelessness trip, a sustainability trip, uh, and a trip focused on immigrant and refugee education. The rest of the trips are more place-based, and so they, depending on where they are, we partner with organizations in those communities for students to learn about what that community has going on. So uh, we do one to my hometown in Greenwood, Maine. Uh, we partner with some uh, food access organizations in uh, the greater Norway area back there. Um, and then we also do trips to Vinyl Haven and North Haven, which are two islands um, off the coast of Maine and see what island life is like um, with some really small communities. And what does it mean to have, um, you know, kind of an isolated uh, experience on a community and what, how important community organizations are to those communities as well. Um, we go all the way up to Arista County, which is the northernmost county in the state. Um, and for those of you who are not from Maine, it's literally in Maine just known as the county because it's so big and <laughs> it takes up the whole northern part of the state. Uh, we have trips up there. We also have trips to uh, two of the Wabanaki uh, communities in the state. So um, the Passamaquoddy communities of uh, Pleasant Point, uh, also known as Sipayak uh, and Indian Township. So um, we're really in those communities talking with um, all of the, the tribal members to ask them what would they like us to do. So there are some aspects of the trips that are service-based and we may be helping to um, do trail work or um, paint the school or the community center, things like that. And other parts are educational where we're just learning about what um, the community members are doing there uh, and students have a chance to get to understand um, a specific part of the state. Uh, and um, all the trips are student-led, so we have each trip has two student leaders, um, and they are fantastic, and the groups really form a fantastic bond um, as they get to know each other and these individual communities around the state. Great. So a quick, a quick question came in while you were speaking, um, and I'll go ahead and answer it, and then if I have a question for the students as well. So the question was, what is the Bowdoin Science Experience, since that came up in the um, response to trips? So, Students essentially have uh, three options for trips. As Sarah mentioned, the McKean Center one will run, McKean Center runs a number of the trips. The Bowdoin Outing Club, which, which Tessa mentioned at the very beginning, runs another huge number of orientation trips. 
And then the Bowdoin Science Experience is a smaller orientation trip option, um, which is primarily for students who are underserved and underrepresented in the sciences. Um, so first generation college students, students um, from minority groups, um, and often also students from rural um, backgrounds where, again, access to STEM related fields um, may not be as accessible given their background. So they are given this opportunity to work pretty closely with faculty members as their peers are off exploring uh, the state of Maine so that they again start to learn a little bit more about the resources and how to access those um, to be successful in their science pursuits um, during their time at Bowdoin. So really quickly, um, Tessa and Diego, can you share what your orientation trips were? I was day hiking at um, Baxter State Park. Great. My first year I was backpacking in the Mahusik Notch region of the Appalachian Trail. And then I would also count the fact that I led two orientation trips back to back whitewater kayaking. So those were also my trips um, that I loved very much. Awesome. So Katie, my follow-up question to kind of orientation, and um, it's come through as a question around tutoring at Bowdoin. So um, how flexible is it uh, to access the center, the hours of operation, but how do you even introduce students to some of the services um, that the Baldwin and Learning Teaching uh, Center offers? Um, so the hours of operation are typically 8.30 a.m. till about 10 p.m. We do employ a couple hundred of Bowdoin students who work in all of these different roles with us. And so as you become an upper class student and if you become an employee, you have 24 hour access to the center. Um, what they started doing last year is you over the summer will get small videos introducing you to different offices on campus. And so we're one of those offices and you just get a glimpse into sort of the ways that you can access those resources. Typically, most people will meet in person with either a professional staff person or a student that they're working with. Um, and then currently we have everything that's also remote and online. So students are still meeting with Q-tutors and writing assistants online, um, as well as meeting with our staff. Um, and we also have a point person who works with any student who's multilingual or whose family is multilingual and they work specifically around things with writing and with speaking. Um, and she is also available now as well. Great. So Christine, I'm going to come back to you with a follow-up question on study abroad. Um, so there are a couple here. Um, first, how do students go about finding the list of opportunities available to them for study abroad? And then the second piece to that, which I'll bundle, is, is it possible to build your own study abroad program? Oh, Christine, you're still muted. So what we have is something called an options list um, instead of an, an unapproved list. It's called an options list. It's actually very easily available on our website. If you go to www.bowden.edu backslash OCS, it's under opportunities. Um, and there'll be a list of several programs. We actually both um, sort it geographically, so you can look about where you want to study, but also um, we sort it by the type of learning environment. So if it's field-based, if it's language immersion, if it's direct enrollment, um, so that students can not just think about where they want to go, because we really try to shift that question to what do you want to do? How do you want to learn? So there's two ways you can sort of sort for programs. About 85 to 90% of our students study abroad on one of the programs on our options list. It, there was about 120 different programs or opportunities on that list. There is a way to identify a better match, a program that is um, better suited to your academic or personal needs through a petition process. And we will vet those on a case-by-case -case basis during our application cycle. So students, if they found a better match, that better serve their needs, and they would have to articulate how that would be, um, could be approved to participate on a program um, that would be you know, different from something on our options list. I wouldn't say necessarily that they are creating a new program as much as identifying a program that suits their needs better. So, um, and we are quite familiar with programs that are not on our list as well. Um, and we, you know, we will also work with the student to identify if they talk about their academic goals and we know of a program that exists, but it's not on our list, we can also sort of advise on and off our list. Great, thank you. So this next question is gonna to go to the students and then any other staff member can um, also add. 
but how does Bowdoin help students explore niche academic interests? So I know, Tessa, you talked about your two different um, academic areas of study, and I know, Diego, you had briefly mentioned a little bit about your research. Um, so if you consider those niche, go ahead and describe more, but if you could talk a little bit about um, that support you've found. So Tessa, let's go ahead and start with you. It's so funny learning Zoom always. <laughs> um, my niche academic interests, well, I think that for me, it really comes down to Bowdoin's commitment to the liberal arts and having distribution requirements. And so this you can very easily find, but there are five distribution requirements and they're encouraged to push students into taking different kinds of classes, classes that'll make you think differently, use your skills differently, um, and ensure that you get this kind of breadth within your Bowdoin education. And so your niche interests, maybe you don't know yet that they're out there, but you are taking a class. I mean, I think for me, one of the distribution requirements I was most nervous to fulfill was visual and performing arts because I was sort of, you know, not thinking I was much of an artist. And I ended up taking a dance class, making dances that I would say now has developed into one of my niche interests. Um, and I went from being kind of embarrassed or shy in that space into feeling like dancing could actually be an important part of my life maybe. So distribution requirements are one place where I think that you can explore broadly and you know identify things that maybe you didn't realize were out there that uh, become more important to you later on. And then I think Diego will be able to speak really well towards doing independent research, doing independent study and having the support of um, professors and departments behind you. All you, Diego. Uh, uh, so even coming into my first year, I was interested in genetics. Um, and we, during my second year, I started talking to professors, reaching out. Um, and I was lucky enough to um, match with a professor who does genetics in his lab. Um, I did two and a half years of research there. But um, so that's been a niche interest that's been, I've been very grateful to have that. But also, I've been able to explore, even though I'm pre-med, even though I like the sciences, I've been able to take classes in like theater, social media, um, some music classes. I've been able to explore the Italian department, so many different things. And you really feel supported when you go there. You don't feel like you have to commit, but you can definitely explore. And there's a lot of time for that as well, so. Great, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions. I'm gonna throw it to Kristen and then um, Tessa. Um, can you talk a little bit about funded internships, how you go ahead and apply for them? And my add-on to that would be just um, fellowships as well and other opportunities that, again, have been funded by Bowdoin or that you've been connected that, again, are um, beyond campus. Sure. Um, I can ha happy to start. So we are committed in our office, and so many of the people on this, on this call are also you know, in the business of working with students to get great summer opportunities to happen, whether they're called fellowships or internships or whatever they may be, projects. Um, and so all of us together, you know, are working to support people doing meaningful things with their summer, whatever that turns out to be for them. Um, and then secondarily, we all have some form of a commitment to remove financial barriers if we can to participating in those activities. So, you know, some, if you think about the internship world, you know, some industries habitually pay interns and some don't, and they consider it more of a developmental educational opportunity and or are very strapped for funding. And so we try to step into that gap where we can to make it possible for people to do internships, even if they would otherwise be unpaid. Um, and so there are between it, all of the different sort of areas represented here, hundreds of opportunities to be paid um, to do something. And many people, you know, many people will hone in on something that's really important to them within the King Center or fellowships. And some people will go to, you know, sort of more than one of those places over their golden career and build a series of really interesting summers. So it's important that everybody get to do something really interesting with their summer. And when we can, we remove the barrier by helping to pay for it. Great, and, and Sarah, can you actually talk a little bit about some of those uh, funded opportunities through the McKean Center before I go back to Tessa? Sure, uh, so we have, the McKean Center has four different programs uh, for summer experiences. One of them is an international program called the Global Citizens Fellows where students can propose 
to work um, with a grassroots organization in another country. Uh, we also have uh, the Bowdoin Public Service Initiative, which teaches students about um, how you can serve the common good through government. And so that um, summer fellowship programs for rising seniors um, to live and work in DC for the summer. And our other two uh, are one, one is based specifically in Maine where we pre-select community organizations in usually Brunswick and Portland um, that students can apply to work at for the summer and it's fully funded. Uh, and the other is one that's a little bit more wide open, which is a little more in the um, career exploration and development um, model where a student goes out and finds an organization that they want to work with um, and they propose to us to work um, with that organization to be funded for the summer. Um, that program is called the Denning for us and it also is um, for us a gateway to help students have a summer experience that will then connect with an academic experience that they want to have the following year. Oh, Seth, yeah. I just wanted to um, emphasize, Diego was talking about his summer research. Um, Bowdoin is one of those extraordinary places where to be successful, a faculty member has to be both an excellent teacher and a scholar. And so we have lots and lots of opportunities for students to remain on campus during the summer and receive funding to work directly with, with faculty on their scholarship. Um, most of these end up being students working in the sciences, and we have about 200 students on campus every summer. Um, I like to, people always say, you know, can you get real science experience at a liberal arts college? And the answer is yes. Um, most definitely, our, our faculty are receiving federal grants, um, the same as they would at any research institution to do work. But we don't have graduate students and we don't have postdocs. And so who works with a faculty member on their research? Undergraduates. And so you can get some really extraordinary opportunities. This is not bottle washing. It's not being second in command to a graduate student. This is really working hands on on the bench next to a faculty member. And this is true across the curriculum, not just in the sciences, but also in other um, scholarly pursuits. Thank you. And then Tessa, can you talk a little bit about your experience working with the fellowships office? I'm going to put you on the spot because uh, I know you've worked with them closely and have some pretty exciting uh, stuff coming up uh, for next year already. Um, thanks, Claudia. Uh, yeah, so the fellowships office is um, to speak a little more about kind of the center that Seth and Christine belong to and the entire Center for Co-Curricular Opportunities also includes the fellowship office. And those are for things like national fellowships. You've got, um, you know, scholarships to send you to graduate school, the Truman, the Rhodes, the Watson, um, which may be in the shoes, in your shoes, you might not be thinking about them yet. But the great thing is that when you're at Bowdoin, you might start getting more exposure to older students who are looking into these incredible opportunities to go to graduate school or to, you know, get a job with that kind of national fellowship funding. So for me, I applied this past year to uh, the Fulbright English Teaching Assistant and went through a really intensive advising process. And so Kate works with Christine and Seth in the office and went through this intensive advising process to figure out where I wanted to apply and how to get kind of the application together that I could feel most proud of. So I'm really proud to share that I just got news last week that I was accepted to um, get this Fulbright to go to Vietnam next year. And I wanted to speak a little bit too to the uncertainty that you guys might be feeling about choosing college at this time. I also am feeling that. And I think all of us are feeling that about what might be coming in the future. And so stay tuned. But um, what I would say about kind of that advising piece and the process applying to this national fellowship is never something that I had imagined for myself until Bowdoin kind of gave that encouragement and getting advisors who made me feel like I could confidently put together an application that I was really proud of and could feel like what I had chosen was a path that I was super excited about. Um, so yeah, I think that it's just another way of kind of taking advantage of the resources that Bowdoin is excited to put forth for its students. And yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> awesome, thank you. So I'm looking at the time and I wanna to try to get to two questions. Um, one 
that was asked very early on in our live stream and I know has come up in a few others, and I'm gonna um, ask Seth and Christina maybe help me out near the end is, can we talk a little bit about the pre-engineering advising and opportunities? So um, we do have three, two engineering options for students. Every year, I think there's always a number of students who come in being really excited about studying the liberal arts and also being interested in engineering. Um, and we do have uh, four programs that students uh, can work with, with different academic offices. Um, so students can explore engineering through 3-2 with uh, Columbia, Dartmouth, Caltech, and the, the University of Maine at Orno, which is mainly for Maine students. Um, and students don't have to be simply physics majors. Uh, there are advisors within the math department, computer science, um, and I believe the in biology and biochemistry as well. Um, for students who are interested in, again, in a variety of different engineering pathways. Um, but I think the important thing is that our students are still, again, students at Bowdoin within the liberal arts um, model and expectation where they're taking their courses, meeting their distribution requirements, and also then preparing themselves for far more of the specific engineering courses they might be taking when they enroll in that dual program. The one that I think, if any, becomes more popular of the handful of students who will actually complete it might be the Dartmouth program because it splits up your time at Bowdoin and Dartmouth so that you actually graduate with your class. Um, your junior year is your abroad year. Again, as Christine had mentioned, a little bit of those domestic opportunities. And after you formally graduated from Bowdoin, then you head back to the Thayer School at Dartmouth to complete the fifth year. So Seth and Christine, I don't know if there's anything you would add from your experiences, even working with students or advising them on those pathways, again, if they're interested in engineering and willing to forgo their like traditional study abroad experience. I would just um, echo, I would just say that our office is the one that can advise on all of those. I think you described it perfectly well. Um, Dartmouth does tend to be the one that gets a little bit more traction. I think partly that it's because um, that it's an interesting model where you're, you're going abroad for your junior year, coming back, and then returning with the same cohort. So the cohort, not just the Bowdoin students, but the entire cohort of students that are there the entire junior year, return for that fifth year. And so it can be in a, you know, most of the students, all the students that we have had have returned for that fifth year, but it leaves the option open that you don't have to. If for some reason it doesn't seem to be the right fit, um, you can just, you know, end your four-year degree here at Bowdoin and not commit to that fifth year. All of our students have committed, but with the three-two program, you have to go all the way through in order to get your your two degrees. So um, we've had a great success with the Bowdoin, and I will let Seth just speak briefly because we, um, although it does tend to attract historically students who have been physics majors, it is increasingly um, attracting students from um, a broader range of STEM fields. Yeah, and in fact, I had a pre-med student who went through the, the program at Dartmouth, and, and I know he worked very closely with the McKean Center um, because the project that he worked on in one of his engineering classes became a, um, he, he turned into an NGO, um, and this was actually a, a, a low-cost standard for um, kids with cerebral palsy. Um, he leveraged some of his connections in China and in Central America and to create this program that provides these um, very low cost, locally manufactured standards um, in a large number of countries now. And he's actually at medical school. Great. So looking at the time, I want to be uh, mindful of everyone's evenings. Um, so I'm going to ask for final remarks and really a last question. Um, so if everyone can actually comment and we'll start again with Tessa and work our way through, but what's the best advice you'd give to a student who's preparing to join the Bowdoin community, um, both during their summers and also knowing that again, they're still learning about this community through virtual options. Um, so Tessa, if I can start with you. I was dreading that you were going to start oh, with this. Oh, I've been thinking about this advice so much. Um, I think the best piece of advice that I can give is that you get excited about Bowdoin and whatever part of Bowdoin it is that excites you. Like, let that fuel you and hold on to that and just let it kind of light you up because I think that no matter where you end up, 
um, probably you'll change a lot over the four years and you might not be able to imagine just what it is you're going to become. And so just to start in a place that you feel excited is the best thing that you could do. And you maybe don't have to plan out the whole thing, but just start on a good thing. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, I'll build off of what Tessa said because I, I love that. And I think it relates to um, my advice won't, won't be surprising related to the common good. And uh, just that every, every discipline at Bowdoin, every element of the college is somehow connected to our commitment to the common good and, and find a way to explore that on your own related to what your passions are. Uh, I think that's a really key piece of advice and something that you can do at Bowdoin is um, think about what you're interested in. You might not know what it is coming in, but a class or a conversation may spark something. Um, pursue that and think about how it relates to the common good in terms of your own uh, experience and definition. Right, Diego. Um, yeah, I guess I'd just say, don't try to plan out too far ahead too. Give yourself time to explore. Um, make sure that you're taking the most of your four years here and just don't pigeonhole yourself. Um, reach out, you'd be surprised. Everyone in the community is very um, willing to help and they wanna help um, and they're very interested in you. So yeah, just be confident and um, explore anything you're interested in. Great, Seth? Um, I'm just gonna sort of amplify what's been said as somebody who deals a lot with students who come in and ask what they should be doing. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to students about what they want to be doing. And I think that, that my biggest piece of advice to any student who's looking at college is to find a place where they're excited to be, where there are lots of things that are happening that, that look exciting and that they're enthusiastic to be a part of because what's gonna make you successful is not marching lockstep down some track but finding out who you are and embracing those things that are most meaningful to you. Um, there, there is never any single track to, or a single way to get to the place you wanna be. And so engage um, and love what you do. And if you don't love what, you, what you're doing, try something else. Thank you. Christine? Yeah, I would say really take advantage of all the opportunities that you might have during the first year to connect with, you know, other first year students, but to really build bridges also with upperclassmen and hear all the different types of stories and paths and journeys they've been on because, you know, one study abroad experience or one college class um, will inevitably have a different perspective on the very same experience or the same class. So listen to lots of different experiences and different sort of stories from students across the four years at Bowdoin, um, because it'll give you insights to how to approach decisions when they do come down the pike for you. Thank you. Katie? Yeah, I think sort of reiterating what people have saying, the people at Bowdoin are pretty amazing. So students, faculty, and staff, it's just really an incredible place to live and to be and to learn. Um, and I think what's so exciting too is you think about your gifts and your strengths, know that they can get harnessed and sort of enhanced at Bowdoin. At the same time, you will change Bowdoin. So sort of that's what makes us so excited to welcome you here is that you have a chance to really have an impact on this place in ways that are unbelievable. And it's as Diego that you can't even sort of imagine. So I hope you have that opportunity and take it. Thank you. Kristen? So, you know, um, many of you may have had a chance to visit Bowdoin in person. And maybe some of you may not have had a chance because events took over. So I will just say, I went to college sight unseen. I left 3,000 miles from where I lived to a place I'd never seen in my life. And it was the best thing I ever did. So, um, and I will give you the same advice that I would if you were in my office and you were looking for a culture of an organization that you wanted to join, um, which is you can tell a lot about how people are with each other. That's what I've learned to look out for. And so if you've been on a lot of these calls, you've gotten some opportunities to how, see how these people are with each other and I hope what you're seeing is there's a really interconnected web um, amongst the offices supporting students relationships with students and hopefully if that's coming across to you and that's the kind of place you want to be then then it's evident in what you're seeing um, and I would just say to um, I do a lot of things but 
getting to know students and your stories are the best part of my day. So I just can't wait to meet you. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to have to reiterate what Kristen just said. I know the best part of my job is getting to read students' stories. And I've learned so much by reading your applications, but then all of the amazing things students do on our campus. And I have the good fortune of being able to catch up with folks like Seth and Christine and hear about what um, students have done with their time at Bowdoin. That's definitely my favorite piece. But I think with my piece of advice is, as you've heard from folks here and probably from the other live streams, is it's really easy to ask for help here. And that starts even as you're waiting to start your actual semester at Bowdoin. All of the folks who've joined us on live streams have been incredibly generous with their time. And they continue to be generous with their time in answering questions of current students and our um, admitted students. So continue to reach out. Um, I think, again, you'll continue to find that people at Bowdoin are really here to support you, whether it's academics, co-curricular life, general campus life, financial aid. Um, this is a community that works with one another. Um, so with that, I want to thank again everyone who's joined me tonight, um, both our panelists, our students, um, and the several hundred people um, that we actually had tuning in tonight. Um, I did want to remind everyone that we do have one other live stream coming up next week. It's our final one on Wednesday. So we are changing the date a little bit. So it's going to be on Wednesday, April 29th at 7 p.m. And that one will feature six current Bowdoin students, so a different collection of students to ask any last minute questions you might have. Um, Bowdoin's uh, reply deadline um, to accept our offer of admission is on May 1st. Um, so again, really take this, these next few days to ask any of those lingering questions. And I know that we didn't get through everything that was being asked through our live stream. So our admissions officers are available via email. We can certainly set up times to chat with you on the phone. And we also have live chat available um, every Monday and Friday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and then again from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, so we're here, we're ready to answer any questions you might have. Um, thank you again for joining us. Congratulations and be in touch. Um, good night and stay healthy, everyone. Bye. <laughs>